Welcome to the Progression Health Podcast. I'm here again with Andrew Coates and Tyler Yasuda. Andrew and Tyler, do you want to introduce yourselves? I've been a coach for 13 years. I write for a whole bunch of stuff like Teenage Muscle and Fitness, Men's Health, Kabuki Strength, Barbend, goes on a little bit. Love writing. Along the way, social media kind of caught fire, which gets me a lot of attention. It's really just a gateway to the longer form resources. And through all that, it's turned into a, a lot of public speaking. I get flown around. I also host my own event called the Partnered with my friend John, the Evolve Strength Business and Coaching Conference is what we call it now. And uh, that's the short version. Very good. And Tyler, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Cliff Notes, competed bodybuilding, powerlifting, and been coaching uh, full-time for the past 10 years. A uh, handful of other businesses between now and then as well. Some of them failed, some of them didn't. And here we are. Great. And also rehabbing the injury. How's the injury going? You know, slow and boring, but it's going. Better than last time, actually, I talked to you. All right. What kind of injury are you having? Uh, I had a full rupture, pec major. And then like when they did the repair, they found there wasn't much tendon left. Uh, so it's kind of a non-ideal repair. But, you know, just a long, slow recovery. There's like a little setback a couple months ago when we reintroduced the barbell. Like the posterior shoulders weren't ready for it. So I feel like those are things that are bound to happen almost with a long enough recovery. You're just going to discover some things, right? I'm actually just going to hijack this straight up. I'm sure Ross has got his questions, but I like this stuff because anybody who's coached for any length of time, you're going to have clients. I mean, even if you've got a, a long history of lifting, stuff happens. You know, you get yeah. minor short-term injuries that you have to work around, which most coaches are pretty good at, or you get some major stuff and... I'll be actually doing a presentation for Kabuki Education Week on this topic. I wrote an article for them. It's on a concept called cross-education. I think most coaches either know what it is or come across it. It's this really cool neurological phenomenon where I think most laymen would probably think, well, if, if I injure a limb, let's say I, I, I've had clients who've had torn biceps or broken ankles, you know, broken forearms, it, it runs a gamut. You think, well, if I train the other limb, I'm going to end up with this shriveled up atrophied limb <laughs> and this big jacked Popeye limb, right? And that's yeah. actually not what happens. The cool thing is if you train the contralateral limb, the healthy limb, then there's a neurological effect that actually spares strength and muscle tissue loss. So you actually, I guess it's sort of a nerve innovation thing. It's not 100% perfectly understood mechanistically, but we know it's, it's really the nervous system and it just can prevent the degree of muscle loss and strength loss you might otherwise see. Now, if you've got someone who's shatter their femur fairly serious <laughs> stuff can you you know completely prevent any muscle loss there i don't think so i i really don't think that's it's that potent but it's going to go a long way towards preventing a lot of the worst atrophy and here's the other benefit how many times have you had clients or anybody listening who and by the way listeners more coaches or listeners more enthusiasts so it'll help enthusiasts enthusiasts get all right so for the enthusiasts if you've ever been in this situation and you've gotten hurt what ends up happening? You're kind of tempted to, oh, I don't want to go to the gym, right? You maybe you don't feel like you know what you're doing, or you just you can get discouraged. But what are you losing? You're losing all the metabolic health benefits of resistance training, the bone mineral density, all that sort of, everything else starts to you know become deconditioned. So you're detraining everything else. You are losing the mental health mood benefit aspect of it, on top of yeah. the fact that your your identity as this active person, especially if you're a competitive athlete in some realm. That takes a hit. Tyler's laughing because I think he understands that one pretty well. And so you get this cascade of negative effects. So instead, if you go, all right, well, A, I know that I cannot load this particular limb in this capacity. Depending on the nature of any injury, you're probably being guided by physical therapy. But then you can do the other side, but you can also do, let's say you've got a busted forearm. Cool. Safety squat bar is your friend. <laughs> load that thing up. You can do all the lower body stuff. You can sit in a leg press. You can train your legs like crazy. So you got kind of two outlets here. One is you do the healthy limb as much as you can, which will actually spare you know, muscle loss, strength loss. But then you go, all right, well, what are all the things I can train? Usually the upper or lower other half that's not injured. And you can go, all right, I'm going to really full send on this training, channel more my recovery into this, bring up weak points. And you get all of those metabolic and mental health benefits of this stuff. So it's something that I think most coaches kind of figure out along the way they come across this research. But I built this resource that, I mean, I think it's the most comprehensive resource that summarizes the research along with the programming tactics and some cardio conditioning 
protocols that's out there. If anybody wants it, just message me. I will literally send it to you. And I love this stuff because we're going to come across this. And I think most lifters sooner or later, even if it's like just something hurts and you know, it's short term, you can still go to the gym. You can still go do all these other things and you're not going to cause any harm and, and make this one giant limb and one shriveled limb. Yeah. That's my experience as well, where when I dislocated my shoulder, Tyler was coaching me and I literally, everything you said, I experienced in the positive sense, you know? Mm -hmm. So even if I was just training purely for the mood benefit alone, because you're kind of depressed, yeah. you're, you're in pain, you're sore. Yeah. Even if it becomes like exercise is purely medicine, it's not like for your physique and aesthetics. It is so beneficial. And then the aesthetics will come after time. You can start lifting heavier. So yeah, hundred percent back up what you say there through experience. Very shortly after the injury, like that's kind of one of the biggest things that helped me guide my choice in PT was uh, having that conversation, like, you know, how on board with the, the idea of me returning to some sort of training as soon as I could, like understanding that I'm not going to be able to load my, my repaired pec, obviously, but like no reason I shouldn't be able to train my uninjured limb, my lower half and so on. But yeah, that did, it narrowed it down really quickly. It's like surprising how few people even okay with it, let alone, you know, on board with it. This is a weird thing that we're seeing challenging the old belief that you just need to rest and that's it where yeah i mean depending on the nature of the the tissue injury full rest probably isn't a very good idea for a long period of time you just need to down tune the stimulus so that way there is some sort of stimulus that allows this tissue to recover now if you've got a fully ruptured tendon especially a major one like a pec tendon or an achilles then yeah there may not be a whole lot you can actually you know, short to medium term due to load that. I mean, if it requires surgical repair, which not all injuries, tears, everything, people think, oh, just give me the surgery and, you know, I'll heal up. First of all, you still have to rehab from surgery. And depending on the nature of the injury, it's not even as if the surgery is the better choice a lot of time. A lot of time when we have rotator cuff injuries of varying degrees, and people think, okay, like I'll get the surgery and that's going to fix everything. But no not automatically, but B, in a lot of cases with a lot of injuries, careful rehabilitation is as effective, if not more effective than just going straight to surgery. Again, it really does depend, but I'll give you another interesting example. If someone fully ruptures an ACL. Okay. And most people think, oh, that's automatically a surgical intervention. Well, my, my partner in a, in an online group program, uh, Bailey, and she's a former client of mine and a coach herself. She's a soccer player and she's in her mid twenties. So she did ultimately rupture her um, ACL full, full thickness. Yeah. But she didn't necessarily believe it right away. She didn't even think because Bailey's really fucking strong. She's got some of the most powerful legs I've ever seen. Coached her. She's, she's incredible. And so she's got powerful hamstrings. And a lot of the function to support the structure of the knee, provide stability to the knee, is overlaps with the function of the hamstring. If you've got really strong hamstrings, a person who is big, powerful, well-trained hamstrings, strong legs, strong quads, everything strong joint, probably walking around in society can function better than a very weak deconditioned person who doesn't have any muscle mass or strength who actually has a fully intact ACL. And that might sound kind of surprising. So does someone automatically need to have an ACL reconstruction surgery? If you're a competitive athlete? Yeah. I mean, and especially if you're younger, but if you're an older person who is very strong, otherwise pretty active, strong hamstrings. A lot of the time they'll say to you, listen, like the, there's just not much point in doing this at this stage of life. So part of that too, and this is a concept that comes out of, I really like the way that Jordan Shallow, muscle doc, co-founder of Prescript talks about this stuff. A lot of our physiology and even biomechanics is we're trying to outfunction structure and humans are incredible at this stuff. Most high level athletes, if you look at and break down their technique on stuff, you'll find interesting theoretical movement flaws that the purists might go you know oh he's not doing that right motherfucker this guy just set a world <laughs> record i think there was a an olympic lifter and i'm not an expert in olympic lifting but there i know that somebody set a record in some way class <clears throat> something i don't know like there's all sorts of different classes but there were some of the purists were criticizing you know the way his elbows move it's like motherfucker he just set a world record right so he's some athletes are just so powerful and they move so intuitively that they don't even necessarily move in the way that biomechanically we might say, oh, that's that's not optimal, right? But they're just really good at outfunctioning their structure because a lot of different people have different structures. And we can actually outfunction 
structural injuries. There's a lot of people walking around with, if you put them in an MRI, <laughs> for some people, an MRI can be valuable. Sometimes it's actually the worst thing you can do. I, I, that's a complicated thing to say. So don't parrot that without the context. In a lot of cases, an MRI is just not going to be conclusive or it might tell you, okay, this person here, you MRI random people, you're going to find disc abnormalities, right? You're going to find rotator cuff abnormalities in totally pain-free and asymptomatic people who move and function fine. And the older the populations get, the more these abnormalities you're going to find. Now, you'll also sometimes find that people have pain that doesn't have a clear association with structural injury. We know by now, I'm not a pain expert. No, go follow Dr. Sam Spinelli. He's probably one of the ones, the physios that treats this with nuance. But how many people listening, or if you guys work with, who expect pain because they previously hurt their lower back. And so they get into certain positions and they're so nervous, they're so tense, right? Their nervous system, they're so tonic, right? Sympathetic nervous system jacked right up that they're so sensitized to pain, they expect it and it manifests as pain. We can oversimplify that and call that psychosomatic, right? And But there's not always a strong linear relationship between the nature of a structural injury and the experience of pain for people. And at least if we acknowledge that, it can be freeing if you're someone who has an experience or an expectation of pain from the past. Definitely low back is one of those places where this thing shows up. But with rotator cuff injuries, the rotator cuff, and, and there's just the overall structure of the shoulder, there are so many muscles that crisscross. We tend to think of the, the rotator cuff as, as the only things that hold the, the shoulder together. Well, the long head of the tricep, I'm getting a little bit specific here, guys, sorry. The long head of the tricep, put it this way, parts of the bicep, parts of the tricep, actually cross the shoulder. Now, what does that mean? That they actually have some level of function to move the shoulder. They're not strong, but also to structurally support and stabilize the shoulder. So if one rotator cuff tendon is shit, let's say fully ripped off, we may not even know it, but the entire function of the muscles of the shoulder, let's say you've got very big, strong delts, a major stabilizer of the shoulder joint. So structurally speaking, we may have something wrong and yet it may not manifest in any sort of inhibition of movement or experience of pain now the reverse can be true we may actually be structurally fairly healthy and yet just something fucking hurts right so these things are just complicated i don't know if there's a, i think the good lesson in there is like don't get too stressed out about or fearful about injury stuff happens humans are shockingly resilient and so again that we can really do a lot to outfunction injury so an injury doesn't necessarily have to mean the end of things yes they're a, a full thickness pec major tendon rupture is a fairly big deal right but obviously you've been going through the process of you had a surgery repaired rehabilitating it but everyday people don't suffer pec tears most no. people <laughs> don't suffer achilles tears this is stuff that tends to happen in high level performance athletes oftentimes a fluke be just because of the sheer amount of force applied to that tissue, right? So I, I don't think that most people have to really worry about those kind of things. But if it happens, guess what? You don't have to quit. You don't have to stop. There, there's just so much you can do that's going to be positive for you. Let's say someone's training and they're kind of concerned about technique. They're like, you know, I got to use good technique or I'm going to get injured. But they're mm. getting stronger. They're building muscle or they're feeling good. One or all of the above. When or how much should they focus on technique if they're progressing? What do you think, both of you guys? Amazing topic, conversation. So trainers, we're all taught that, and everybody coming in thinks, oh, I, I need to hire a trainer because I'm afraid to get hurt. One of my big things is, first of all, I, I like defeating the narrative that there's a, a strong relationship between form and injury. And I used to think there was. But my opinion has changed over time, especially because I've gotten into the work of, there's this tribe of physical therapists. Now I find that they get a little bit pedantic sometimes. And if, if any of them listen to this, I apologize, but you guys get pedantic. Uh, and they like to pick fights. And, but they're amazing at taking the, the volume of the research and challenging some of these prevailing narratives and some of the fear-based language that some fitness professionals still engage with or people branded around certain ideas. And there are some pretty prominent figures in the industry I don't really need to say names. Some are outright charlatans, but some no, you are should actually... call them out. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Or some, okay, I'll, I'll say one name, like someone like Nadia Aguilar. Like, I don't even take him seriously. Like, it's like Gollum loose in the fitness industry. <laughs> Just his functional pattern stuff. I mean, this is complete nonsense, right? You should go watch these videos for, for two minutes and you're like, what the hell is this? But there are other people who are not naughty 
who are highly respected, highly regarded, influential figures whose work, maybe it's research, maybe it's just their principles, haven't aged well with the evolution of what we know about you know, resistance training and injury risk. So some of those ideas are outdated. And maybe it's not fair to judge someone based on 20-year-old ideas that now if they branded hard and dug in a firm position and they're like, nope, this is right, everybody else is wrong. Now, hopefully people evolve with time. But there isn't a really strong relationship between technique and form and injury risk, right? And if you get into the data on, it's usually presented as like injury rates per 1,000 hours of participation. We see that resistance training, strength training, actually has very, very injury rates. Like it's one of the safest things you could possibly do. And when you contrast it against all the health benefits, we, a lot of which we talked about earlier, there may not be a better reward to risk ratio of anything you will ever do in your life than strength training, right? So the idea that we're still worried about stepping into a gym and, oh my God, we're going to hurt ourselves. Again, body's good at out-functioning structure. Now, what actually increases injury risk? Well, there are a handful of things. One is poor sleep, like just that sort of lifestyle stuff can increase injury risk. Hydration status is a huge one. Very, very big one. Definitely could affect our discs in our, our spine are affected by our hydration status. Okay. Uh, previous injury. Previous injury is the best predictor of future injury. So, you know, in your case, Tyler, you know, you're probably going to be conscientious about future pec injuries, right? Yeah. And again, we don't want to make someone fearful, but we want to make sure that they're doing the best they can to insulate themselves against outsized risk. I would say improper use of load would be a very good one. And so a lot of time, what we think or we'll say is, oh, it's bad form is probably poor control and, and using too much load that just someone's not in control of. Uh, so if you have, there's a concept that I hope this will be helpful for people listening. Uh, the difference between active and passive range of motion or mobility or flexibility, whichever term you want to use, they're not necessarily interchangeable for, for our purposes here. They're fine. So let's say if you're standing and you stand on one leg, maybe you lean against the wall just for balance and you, without touching your left knee, you lift your left knee as high to your chest as possible. Okay. That's what you can control under voluntary muscular contraction. And then let's say you take both your hands and pull on your knee and pull higher. And so most of the time, almost everybody, you're going to be able to pull your knee higher. You can do this laying on the ground. Actually, it's probably easier. And you can pull your knee even higher until you reach what would probably be bone on bone restriction. Hey, we can't go further. So the difference between what you can actively control and what you can passively pull yourself into is active versus passive mobility. So what happens, let's say, what's another position where you would get into very deep, like your knee comes up really high relative to your chest. Well, if someone squats super deep, what happens if someone really just dive bombs their negative and has no mechanical tension on the muscles that control it and they just drop? Okay, well, that rapid descent is that, and especially if that's done under too much load, does that increase the likelihood of a knee injury, hip, low back injury? I would argue yes. You know, I don't want to have people fearful of this. And there are people who can actually under control drop a bit more aggressively. I think negatives performed with more control, a little slowly, better for mechanical tension and muscle and better for, you know, building muscle. But I think it's also just a good strategy to mitigate injury risk. We can't truly prevent injuries, but we can mitigate them. And then the big one that the physios go really hard at is the idea of deadlifting with a rounded back. Oh, it's not dangerous. I think that one requires more nuance. So there is some research. But the research doesn't actually go very heavy, which is my criticism of this. So their contention is that you know, there's no increased risk of injury with a, lifting with a rounded back. I mean, I think the caveat here is you're set up for a deadlift. You round your thoracic. Well, first of all, that's actually going to give you greater reach. You can get lower to the ground. It's actually going to help you. But if you still manage to brace your core effectively and your lumbar spine position is fairly rigid and flat, I think that can be a recipe for an excellent deadlift. Now, if you got the proverbial teenager in the gym with the posture of a dog taking a shit and their spine is uncontrolled and they're lifting something that they obviously can't control, it's too heavy for them, and their entire spine is rounding and flexing at multiple segments while they lift, they're not braced. Is that a recipe for injury? Probably, but guess what? We've also seen someone who is lifting too much load that they can't control. Oh, another important injury risk before I forget it is making the large jumps and increases in volume and intensity in short amounts of time, right? That is a good way to get yourself hurt if you're just ego going lifting. Through. Yeah, ego lifting. So a lot of those things tie in together. Now, 
I would argue that I still think that relatively unskilled beginner to maybe even intermediate lifters who are lifting with rounded backs, I still think should be cautious because again, the research on this doesn't go past, I don't know if it's like 24 kilos or something, right? And we're talking about people doing hundreds and hundreds of pounds in deadlifting. I think a core brace should be an automatic and I'm just not willing to say, I think there's no additional risk of just having a really shoddy rounded back deadlift near maximal loading, right? I'm just a little cautious with that one. Now, the converse is we don't want to be so damn fearful of, oh my God, I dropped my pen on the ground. All right, let me brace. Let me get my spine in. <laughs> let me like, you know, oh, lift your legs, not with your back. That's dumb. That's actually really stupid. We act. Lumbar spine is designed to flex and extend. Thoracic spine is designed a bit more for rotation, but we need to be able to bend, flex, load our spine, you know, reasonably. So that way we're not always fearful. Oh my God. Like the irony of this is you get to my age, I'm 45. And, and a lot of lifters, you don't necessarily get hurt in the gym. You, I've hurt my shoulders a lot more reaching behind my back, scratching. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I felt something <laughs> like tear in my shoulder. I'm like, shit. Okay. That's how I've actually hurt my shoulders. I hurt my knee recently. I took a step. And I pivoted on it funny. And I'm like, oh, that felt weird. Okay, I think it's fine. I went and lifted, trained in the gym after, and that was sore afterwards. But, you know, I hurt myself by stepping and turning on my foot funny. So like those innocuous things you're going to do every day just somehow get you hurt. But honestly, you need to be able to bend over without fear, pick random. My cat, I don't like set up for a good deadlift race every time I pick up my like 15 pound cat. That would be really <laughs> stupid. I just kind of round my back, scoop them up, throw them on my arms struggles a little bit sometimes we want to be able to do that like parents picking up young kids just pick up the bloody kids and honestly this is the sort of stuff this is movement quality we want to be able to retain and do without fear and i think that's the most important message that we'll talk about today very good and, and tyler what do you think what's your opinion on form and technique, yeah injury I, risk? I tend to believe and i wonder to what extent this is just influenced by a lot of the client base that i work with but i tend to believe that there's a pretty wide range of what we could consider like safe technique mm -hmm. or safe form. Absolutely. But really where you start to like break that down is for an athlete, let's say you're competing in Olympic lifting, powerlifting, what you're aiming for is efficiency, right? And like being more efficient just means you perform at a higher level. But I think the injury risk aspect of this is more so within this wide, you know, range of what could be considered good technique, how consistent are you, right? Because just as much as taking a step in a funny way, mm. it's not necessarily that your body's incapable of doing that. It's more so kind of the dynamicism or the unexpected change. So you can imagine, let's say your deadlift example, I'm just going to use Ross as an example. I'm not saying he does this, but to say Ross is generally up to, you know, 85% of his max. He's deadlifting with a pretty flat back, pretty even distribution of load between say his quads and his glutes. And then he gets to 90% one day and at 90%, his back is now super rounded. He's deferred load away from his glutes and his quads that he's used to using to manage that load. And he's now deferred that to his, his erectors, his back. I think in that position, at that kind of load, the inconsistency of technique is somewhat dangerous. Agreed. Um, but take Ross 2.0 or Ross B. If Ross B always trains in that kind of slightly rounded position, a little bit less load in his glutes at his knees, and he has a little bit more going through his spine or through the muscles around his spine all the time, always trains that way. He gets up to that same 90%. His technique looks exactly the same as it always has. I don't think that would be that, that unsafe. Agreed. I think it's just the, the variance at that high percentage. It's because it's all the structures that you're loading. So if you, for example, have you know partway along your spine, you're in a flex position and the discs and your vertebrae are used to that. You're very tolerant to that position and you gradually progressively overload it, honestly, you're going to probably be stronger than an average everyday person who tries it for the first time with a lot less load. So 100%, I think that principle idea is sound. You're right. And uh, again, I find that uh, Jordan Shallow's got some really good stuff when it comes to this. How does he explain it? You look at it through two lens. Like if you've got more force applied to a structure and then what ends up causing pain or injury is like, well, he'll say this, I'm really just paraphrasing him, is we can, we often default to thinking, let's just make that structure stronger. Why don't we ask ourselves, why is that structure bearing more of the load? Why is that hurting anyway? Why is, you know, this particular hip flexor really pissed off every time we squat? Well, maybe we have to actually look at the fundamentals of how we're squatting, change our position, figure it out. So that way that particular structure isn't being asked to do 
way more. He uses a story, and I find this story really funny, but it's actually really illustrative. He talks about an old client he had when he was a younger personal trainer. And this guy was, as, as he likes to playfully put it, involved in a motorcycle club. So this guy, three weeks in a row, ends up stabbed at the same bar. It was hmm. Don Cherry's on somewhere. And any anybody who like knows prescript or knows shallow, you've probably heard this story. So anyway, you know, the guy calls in. He's like, yeah, no, I got stabbed. He's like blocking a knife and gets stabbed in the forearm, right? So, you know, Jordan's illustration is he doesn't turn around and say to the guy, well, you know, have you considered like duct taping a phone book around your forearm? Or how about wear some chain mail to the bar, right? This this restaurant. He's like, dude, stop going to that fucking place where you keep getting stabbed, right? Stop hanging out there. So deal with the force applied to the structure, not necessarily always defaulting. Well, let's make the structure stronger, right? And I, I find that analogy really funny. He's good at them. So I would, if you guys are enjoying this stuff, because we're getting a little technical on this, I hope I haven't lost anybody. Usually people ask me about social media growth. This is definitely a departure, but I love riffing on this. You, Ross, do you guys have anything else you want to take somewhere off? Because I just hijacked this all, which was fun. I'm totally enjoying it. I was going to say, the pandemic for the fitness industry, shutting down the gyms, that was like really challenging and difficult. You know, it's like for me working on the gym floor and now the gym is just shut indefinitely. And basically I had no business, right? But now you've seemed to bounce back tenfold. You're, you're mm -hmm. thriving. How did you kind of come through that challenge? You know, what kind of mindset did you have? What lessons did you learn? And what, what, what did you do in that process to bounce back from the pandemic? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, first of all, and I mean, I'm not even going to pull any punches. This is the dumbest thing that these, these governments and countries ever did was, you know, shutting down gyms and discouraging people. Like their images still of nets, basketball nets being cut down and like things being nailed on a basketball net so people can't shoot. Like telling people they can't go outside. Holy shit. And there may be some people defending, well, we didn't know what we were dealing with at the time. It's like, guess what? A lot of us knew exactly what was going to happen to the mental health and the, and the metabolic health of like a large population. I mean, some of those people were just going to go hide indoors for, you know, a few years already. You know, someone's going to listen to this and think that has some sort of ideological, like, low to it. No, 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 no. Like, no, I'm, I'm talking strictly from um, an evidence-based point of view. None of what happened, Sean. I can't live within that because that's just, you, you want to do something that's good for your mental health, physical health? Don't follow anybody on either side of that spectrum. The talking yeah. heads who just, like, build status. Useless and irrelevant people, mostly who gain status by talking about these things on social media and generating outrage. Most of you are listening to, and it's your particular brand of outrage that you agree with. You don't even realize how much it's getting you wound up. And then they share the outrage from the other side that makes you mad. But you know what? Do yourself a favor. Turn that stuff off. Focus on like cat memes. My friends send me cat videos now you're talking. on Instagram. I posted this recently in my story. Like that stuff will make you feel good. Okay. Like plug in, this is not my analogy. I've heard this before. It's like, we think about the diet, the food that we eat and how it affects our health. Guess what? The psychological diet of the stuff we expose ourselves to. And there's a fire hose of it in every way, shape or form. We actually have to take a little more responsibility of what we're exposed to. So that's important. Now back on track. First of all, I'm a believer that you build when the sun is shining. I worked very, very hard on having a very strong, secure in-person business. And what that led me to have was being in the position where eight years ago, a couple of days ago, I moved into a home that I bought. And so you know, I had this big space in this basement. So when all this stuff happened, guess what? I quickly scooped up a bunch of fitness equipment. I set up a home gym and I've been adding to it the whole time. And a lot of my clients were very happy and we just trained in there. You know, we were smart about it one person at a time. And just train them. And a lot of them, there's a cardiologist I trained. And he said, like, being able to train, he trained four or five days a week with me. It's like, it was what kept him going through all this to be able to like, show up and, and be of service to people during the worst of these times, right? And there are probably going to be someone who's there, oh, you're not, gyms are supposed to help, you're not supposed to do that. It's like, that was fairly arbitrary based on your geographic location, whether you're in Florida or California, Toronto, I think. Ontario had gyms shut for at least six out of the 12 months. Uh, maybe it was, actually, no, I think it was way longer. I think it was nearly a year. I know California was one of the worst. Florida was like six weeks and that we're back open and that was it, right? Honestly, like you look at the health outcomes, I think it was Johns Hopkins put out something and there was no difference in, in health outcomes on the aggregate, whether you had really severe lockdowns or, or very, very moderate ones. Human nature is just human nature. And so... Yeah, I just ran my my space. And now what I do is I split my time between the gym I've always contracted at, at my home gym. And I've been adding and adding pieces to it. I'm going to have turf installed really soon. I've got 
a leg press, cable tower, squat rack, full set of hex dumbbells. I've got a glute drive being delivered on Thursday. I just decided recently to do more stuff with it. And I've been able to invest in this and actually secure it. Now, not everybody lives in a house, but the point is, is I worked hard to the point where I put myself in a position where I, oh, I have this space available to do it and pivot on a dime. And I just continue to build that. And so now I have the versatility. Now I get to spend more time at home with my cat, which actually makes me happier. And I'm able to punch <laughs> longer hours. But here's the other thing I did is just before all this stuff started, I'd already been writing for a few of the publications I write for, but I just said, okay, I need to have more social media presence to complement the fact that I write for T Nation and, and so on. And so I just kept showing up on social media every day and just post something, post something, post something, refine it, work on the skill of writing, engage with people, respond to everything. And, you know, at first it was slow, but it grew and grew and grew. And then very early on in the process, uh, Dr. Mike Isertel, who I've known, I met him in 2017 here and he came to a seminar. And he was one of the ones that like gave me the first boost. And he, him and Nick Shaw, they're both friends of mine, love RP stuff. Guys dive into it. They're incredible. So they actually did an episode recently and they're talking about a lot of stuff about, you know, being a successful trainer. And they actually, someone texted me, he's like, hey, the guys were talking about you on their podcast. I'm like, what? Okay, I listen. And they're talking about everything I did and how Mike just, He's following me because we knew each other and he's just liking some of the stuff that I post. So he would just splash up on his wall and would drive hundreds upon hundreds of followers my way. So he was a big part of seeding that first bit. Jordan Sight was sharing my stuff, Jonathan Goodman, some other people in the industry, started getting on podcasts, you know, more and more. And gradually and gradually it grew, it grew. I went on a ton of podcasts. Everybody would ask, I would always say yes, Ross, like yours, just started getting out everywhere. Meanwhile, I'd done a lot of travel within the industry because I had the means because I worked really hard. So I've made a lot of contacts, a lot of friends. When things opened up in 2021 a little bit, I started going back down to stuff. I got invited to come speak at one of these conferences that I had previously attended a bunch. And that blew the doors off of that. So now all of a sudden I'm at all these events, speaking at these things. I mean, this one's just still sort of mind blowing. But a friend of mine invited me to come and be a replacement speaker. And I look at this lineup and it's Lane Norton, Jordan Syatt, me, and the Hermoses are like the five graphics that I've got. And I'm like, holy shit. So as it turns out, they hadn't taken the Hormoses off yet because they had to drop out. So they actually grabbed, and then they brought in Beatrice Cooley and then a couple other people. But ultimately, I was, quote, one of the replacement speakers for the Hormoses, which, of course, is not, you can't replace them, right? We're not in the same stratosphere. But kind of a cool little thing I get to say. So there was a ton of this stuff over the last few years, and 2024 is looking insane. We rebooted our conference late last year. But every time there was an opportunity, someone said, hey, you know, would you come do this right for T Nation for the first time or some of the other publications that followed or come speak or, you know, start a podcast or whatever, come on a podcast. I, I would say yes. And if it was a skill that I felt I needed to work on, I would go and figure it out. And so just leaning into these opportunities every time they were thrown your way. And meanwhile, just being really consistent with the things that mattered, like the writing, like the social media and social media grew and grew and grew. And of course, people can piss and whine and moan about social media, rah, influencers. I know a lot of people who do this and I, I find them really funny. Because if you catch this in you, I'm going to like the people listening, the enthusiasts are probably not going to care about this stuff, but just watch. If you've got people, fitness professionals who are doing this, they desperately crave the status that they think comes with having a larger follower. Now, some of the people with larger followings are Photoshopping their shit. They're buying followers. It's fake. Like, honestly, a lot of this stuff's rubbish, but there are a lot of really good, awesome human beings in the industry. I've talked about people like Jordan Shallow, Dr. Mike Gizertel, Molly Galbraith, Girls Gone Strong. They have great followings, they have great information, they've built incredible resources, they're doing wonderful things. Those people are making the world better. Go follow and engage with those people. They're awesome. And I just kept doing it, kept doing it, and all of a sudden kept, things kept exploding and spiking, and I'm getting opportunities I couldn't imagine, never have dreamed of. And I think it's just the mindset of, all right, this is a circumstance, this is scary, we don't know what's going on. I'm going to control what I can control, which is literally the best life advice you can ever apply in any situation, right? Even when shit is really awful. And you just show up, you do the work, you recognize the narratives. This is my social media post today. People are very, very good at weaving stories and narratives about why they won't go do hard things. Right? And quite frankly, I think more time, energy, effort goes, anxiety goes into the story about yeah. why you won't go do the thing, then it would have taken for you to actually act on and go do the thing. And then you break inertia, you build momentum. And that is true of almost anything when it comes to fitness, nutrition, health. And if someone's choosing to listen to this podcast, my guess is they're good at acting. They're good at the consistency side. 
but they see people around them who have stories and excuses. And it gets frustrated. I mean, those people have to help, them, help themselves. And I don't believe in shaming anybody for excuses, but I want those people to wake up and realize, no, most of these things are not valid reasons. Most of these things are high energy narratives that are woven to shield you from the shame. And it doesn't even work very well to prevent shame of realizing that the choices you're making because they are choices most of the time are not conducive to the long-term health outcomes we want. And we saw that on aggregate during the pandemic. It's almost like a gym mentality of like, you know, you show up consistently, you work hard, you build momentum, you start to see gains, but then also getting help from other people as well along the way. So kind of like staying consistent using that gym mentality. I'm not even sure, maybe Tyler, you have a better phrase for describing the gym mentality, but then also asking for help as well, not trying to do it all on your own. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing I would, I would sum that up as that whole, we, we've talked about this before, Ross, that model, like do it anyway. Right? Like there are probably countless reasons that you could give yourself or excuses you could come up with to not do whatever the thing is, but you do it anyway. But I, I do think, Andrew, in your case, that that's maybe what's unique about your circumstances, that it's not just leaning into that mentality and like very much living by that. You seem to have found a lot of success in really identifying the opportunities that people are putting in front of you, like not being afraid of taking those, whether you felt like you were fully prepared or not. And I think so many people, one of the best bits of advice I've ever gotten, one of my clients actually is business advice, but it applies to a lot of things. He's telling me, learn how to screw up as fast as you can, because if you can just make a choice and it's the wrong choice, you at least learn that it's the wrong choice. You make your next choice before the next guy would have made his first choice, right? Just do that and do it quickly and you'll learn fast. And you also succeed faster or succeed earlier than most people. There's an element, there's a piece of context that's really good to add to this. It'll get people to think. And and I know Alex Hormozzi does a really good job of this. Alex is good for these kind of witticisms. But when you're looking at decisions, can it lead to a catastrophic outcome? And most decisions, no. Like, let's say you jump off a building and you risk paralyzing yourself or losing an eye. Those are really catastrophic things that if for whatever the fuck you're doing risks like the kind of bodily harm that is irreparable then don't do that sort of stuff or you got to be really goddamn thoughtful about it but most things don't have that kind of consequence like if you do something or say something that could lead to the loss mm -hmm. of a marriage or a long-term relationship because you like hurt someone that bad because of a choice you make cool don't do stuff like that that's not cool but if the downside risk of the choice is low cool then there's do make that choice quickly. If there's fairly substantial potential for a worst case scenario, you actually make that choice very deliberately and slowly to make sure it's a smart choice. And it's just identifying, all right, is there much catastrophic downside risk of acting on this? Nope. Cool. All right. Full send. Don't think about it too much. Act on it. Fail. Learn. Okay, cool. That worked. Whatever. You move on to the next one. It's just those really big things. Could Something could go terribly wrong if you make that choice you actually need to be really deliberate and thoughtful with those choices. There was one more thing in all this that I don't think I articulated super well. I alluded to because I travel to a lot of stuff and through my media, I've always shared and supported other people. If you take this attitude of what's in it for other people and you try to support, create, do kindnesses, look for opportunities for them, things that you think are appropriate, especially when you see people who are working hard to earn it and put themselves in a position to benefit from it. And a lot of this stuff goes on behind the scenes. Some of it shared on social media then what ends up happening is people just turn around and the universe gives you back tenfold from everything you could ever put out. Most people by now have heard of scarcity mindset, abundance mindset. It gets tired, what have you. But fundamentally, these things are really important. And a lot of people function in a scarcity mindset. If I do something for someone else, oh, I might get burned. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. Where my attitude is, cool. If I do nice things for 10 people, nine of those people, or let's say eight of those people don't reciprocate or do anything, one, in some unexpected, unique way, creates an outsized opportunity. I'm still ahead by a lot. Now, let's say that other person, that last person, actually takes in some sort of way that burns you, right? Actually, like, manipulates you, costs you money, et cetera, what have you. Then the mistake is to go, oh, well, I'm never going to do that again for anybody. Because then you lose a little bit of your soul and the goodness in your soul when you stop doing that kindness, Instead, you chalk that up literally as an accounting concept of, all right, that's a sunk cost. That's a, you just write that off as being part of the universe. 
But if you keep applying that math, and again, if one person does something out, outsized positive, one person burns you, takes you a little bit, and the other eight are not in any really meaningful way ever able to do something to reciprocate. You are going to come out so far ahead, and it's such a powerful multiplier across a long enough time horizon. And then I think most people are just afraid to give and to do those kind of things. Now, there's another side to this. And it's like when you're saying yes to opportunities, there does come a point in life where you say yes to too much stuff, you're a people pleaser, you are being taken off track of the things that are really important to you in your career, your personal life, family, what have you. And it's not beneficial to you. You have to recognize that and develop good boundaries around that. And you have to learn to say no to better and better opportunities. Another Hormozy sort of thing that he talks about a lot as you grow in business, as your life grows, people will will still just ask a lot of shit from you. You just got to get really clear on, all right, cool. Well, what are my boundaries? Am I showing up for someone who's always been great? Or am I really just being pulled away from the things that matter? And this is going to be detrimental to me. And then sometimes you just got to go do and show up for, for things and people. You just got to do the right thing, right? You got a really sick friend who needs a ride to the, the hospital or whatever. You take you know good care of that person. But at a certain point, I suppose a really good example is once I got really busy with writing, I couldn't even have the bandwidth to give as many articles as probably the publications I write, write for would like, right? I don't even like, yeah, you know, I can't even do that. And then someone might pop up and go, hey, you know, will you come and write for my blog for free? And it might've been an opportunity that would have been a great kickstart, but now that you're kind of already three or four, you know, fairly mainstream ones, writing for, you know, someone's blog is probably a pretty low leverage opportunity. Now, if that person is a great friend and has been supportive along the way, you still might do it. But that person now all of a sudden is popping up and going, oh, now I can benefit from having you on here because you're doing so well. That's probably an opportunity you're going to politely say no to because if you say yes to that, you may be saying no to writing another article that you'll get paid for and a lot of exposure on you know something like a muscle and fitness. And for me, I'm really clear on this. So I've been asked to, to do a whole bunch of things that simply my time just I couldn't accommodate. So I'm polite and I'm really grateful that people think of me, but you know, I'm comfortable saying, hey, I can't do this. Going into another mindset shift, but in a, a different line of thought. So you have a post, Andrew. Stop treating your workouts and nutrition like a one night stand. And I feel like it ties in because it's a complete switch. It's like, it's just going from a mindset that doesn't serve the long term to one that does serve the long term. Can you just speak to that a little bit and how maybe you've experienced clients make the switch or you see it as a, a common pitfall? I mean, there, there's two things here. One is it's a metaphor about commitment. You have to look at it through the long view. You can't lose all the weight. You know, you can't spend you know, a decade gaining weight and expect to lose it in three months and then go back to your old behavior. It doesn't work that way, right? My argument is that I think when someone gets consistent and feels how good it feels, they would never want to go back. So a very simple answer is, it's just a funny little witticism that my hope with these social media things, I honestly, I want things to be valuable to people. And some of them end up being... I don't like writing fluffy stuff. I really try to avoid that. A lot of people write some really generic bland crap, but I want anything I put up on social media to at least be meaningful to people. But sometimes they can be superficial pieces of wit that my hope is that it will lead people to do one of several things. One is go into my longer form media. Remember the start of this episode, this resource that we talked about, about training with an injured limb. That's the stuff I want people to get into. I want them to come to the podcast. I want them to you know come see me speak at an event. But if someone enjoys the daily little pieces of, of wisdom or wit, is, or wit and it keeps them around and it leads them down the path to the better stuff when they need it, or even if it's just like, my favorite response is always, I needed that today. And if it just gives them a little bit of a boost, a little bit of motivation, fluffy motivation on a day that they're having a rough one, it kept, kept them going, that's always worth it. And ultimately, I don't really promote a whole lot of stuff. People message me and they're like, hey, you know, can I talk to you about online training, what are your rates, blah, 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 whatever. People will inquire. And given the size of my media, I get more than enough inquiries that I keep to me as busy as I want to be. Every once in a while, I'll throw it out there. Hey, you know, if you guys are serious, I, I will talk to a few people. Not the proverbial, hey, I have two spots in my coaching and you really have 15, right? <laughs> that stuff's cheesy. But sometimes social media is just a, a slightly more superficial touch point. You can't necessarily go super in depth, but that's why you build a long form media resources like podcasts, like articles, like YouTube channels. 
in order to give people more good stuff. And if they like what you're doing, they like your philosophies, they like your persona, they feel connected to you, then you're more likely to be the person that they'll reach out to at the end of the day. And that continues to you know, keep the livelihood that I have, which allows me the freedom to do the things that I enjoy, like collect picture figurines or vinyl <laughs> records or spend a bit more time with my cat. Or at some point, <laughs> hopefully I'm terrible. I'm a terrible workaholic, but carve out a little bit more time. If a meaningful relationship happens to you know materialize in my life, we'll see, right? Stay tuned. But that's more and more my philosophy to social media. And sometimes, I mean, I'm not trying to write oh, I need this to go viral, but there's some stuff that I'll reuse because I know it does really well. And if it goes viral, people are sharing living hell of it, shows up on the Explore page, I get more followers, followers grow. Those are more people that I can direct to my resources and I can share the other great resources and the people that I respect who've been helped to me, my friends I think are doing wonderful things. I can share them through my media. Those people connect with them. Everybody benefits from it. And that's why I laugh at the people who have such toxic and negative attitudes about social media because it's, again, like I said, it's born of this bitterness for something that they res they resent it because they don't have it. And they want it. They crave it. And they want all of the status-based trappings that they think come with it. It's like, that's not reality. Your, your attitude's a problem. I'm almost out of time, guys. So this is wonderful. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Everybody listening, guys. Everybody listening. You know what the boys ask once in a while, but you haven't reviewed the podcast. I know you haven't done it. <laughs> so... Here's what I'm going to say. It takes no time at all. Go. At the red, red light, maybe, or at least like a reminder, you're probably listening. You know, if you're cooking in your house, pop open the app, give a five-star review. If you're listening by the end of this episode, chances are you're going to give five-star because I can't imagine you give a two-star and yet listen to the end of these episodes. That would, that would seem silly to me. Give them a five-star, maybe write up something. How's this been meaningful to you? And... If you really enjoyed this episode, this is the big one, okay? Especially all that talk about injury stuff. Take this and share it with someone in your world who's dealing with that right now. Maybe someone who's struggling with the gym because this stuff is probably going to help them. And that way you're sharing the guys with more people because they're doing, they're not, this is not, you know, a million download show. None of us are doing that. Chris Williamson, multiple sponsors making, you know, making a full livelihood out of it. This is something we do as a passion outside of our coaching and our training. So these are little gives back that can actually enrich the people in your life because it's obviously enriching you because you're still listening, right? So thank you for that. Uh, guys, Tyler, Ross, thank you for having me on. I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you as well.